Welcome to this series of videos, which seeks to both explain Einstein's special theory of relativity and to challenge some of its conclusions and implications. We are going to examine what it was that led Einstein to adopt the Lorentz transformation and use it to modify some straightforward classical formulas such as this, and transform it into this, and in so doing challenge the classical view of time, distance, and mass. The Special Theory of Relativity was published in 1905. In the years leading up to 1905, there were numerous actively debated and interrelated scientific theories circulating. And we will discuss some of these later in this series. But for now, it will suit our purpose if we simply regard the special theory of relativity as a solution to a set of issues that concerned Einstein. The issues came about because Einstein could not reconcile five quite basic and classical scientific theories or hypotheses. One or some or all of them had to be wrong. The five conflicting theories were the principle of relativity, the law of propagation of light, the classical theorem of the addition of velocities, the time interval time between two events is independent of the condition of motion of the body of reference. The space interval distance between two points of a rigid body is independent of the condition of motion of the body of reference. In this series of videos, we will step through Einstein's arguments on just how he believed these hypotheses could not be reconciled, and how, as a result, he adopted the Lorentz transformation and constructed the special theory of relativity. Einstein's discussions are developed in his book Relativity, the Special and the General Theory. Throughout this series, I will utilise quotes from the edition published in 1916. In this first video, we will discuss the first item on the list, the principle of relativity. But before doing so, we need to understand the closely related subject of coordinate systems. Einstein carefully spells out in his book that when talking about any physical event, we cannot just say it happened. We must be specific about where it happened. He clarifies how we can do this. In the physics of measurement, this is attained by the application of the Cartesian system of coordinates. He takes care to elaborate. Referred to a system of coordinates, the scene of any event will be determined, for the main part, by the specification of the lengths of the three perpendiculars or coordinates x, y, z, which can be dropped from the scene of the event to those three plane surfaces. So in this example, if we measure the distances from the x, y and z axes in units of metres, we can say that the event took place at a point equal to 6 metres on the x axis and equal to 7 metres on the y axis and equal to 3 metres on the z-axis. He goes further and reminds us that to identify any event, not only must we identify the three axes, there is another necessary parameter, time. An event, wherever it may have taken place, would be fixed in space with respect to k, by the three perpendiculars x, y, z on the coordinate planes and with regard to time by a time value t. So to identify an event we say 
where it took place and the time it took place. While this may seem little more than common sense, it is nevertheless a vital understanding if we are to follow Einstein's line of thought. For Einstein now identifies two quite specific coordinate systems. These are the coordinate systems K and K1, as seen here. He will use these examples throughout his book to illustrate his arguments. This video will follow his lead. The first coordinate system, K, indicated by the red arrow, represents a railway embankment which is stationary with respect to the coordinate system K1. While the K1 coordinate system, indicated by the red arrow, represents a train travelling alongside the embankment with a uniform velocity equal to V relative to the embankment. Using these examples of coordinate systems, Einstein will conduct various thought experiments, the conclusions of which will lead us to his special theory of relativity. He lays out the essence of each thought experiment. What are the values x1, y1, z1, t1 of an event with respect to k1 when the magnitudes x, y, z, t of the same event with respect to k are given? It is by answering this question under different circumstances that Einstein will reveal the inconsistency that exists between the five theories mentioned earlier. We now come to the first of those theories, the principle of relativity. The principle of relativity had been known to classical science for many years. For example, in Isaac Newton's Principia, published in 1687, Newton describes the principle of relativity thus. The motions of bodies included in a given space are the same among themselves, whether that space is at rest or moves uniformly forward in a straight line. Now the English may be a little antiquated, but if instead of space we substitute system of coordinates, then the meaning becomes more clear. Einstein himself provides several definitions in his various papers. In his paper, The Foundation of the General Theory of Relativity, Einstein gives this description. If a system of coordinates K is chosen so that, in relation to it, physical laws hold good in their simplest form, the same laws hold good in relation to any other system of coordinates K1, moving in uniform translation relatively to K. He provides a slightly modified description in his 1916 book. If, relative to K, K1 is a uniformly moving coordinate system devoid of rotation, then natural phenomena run their course with respect to K1 according to exactly the same general laws as with respect to K. This statement is called the principle of relativity. For a last bit of clarification, it is also worth looking at Richard Feynman's more colloquial description given in his famous lectures. If a spaceship drifting along at a uniform speed, all experiments performed in the spaceship and all the phenomena in the spaceship will appear the same as if the ship were not moving. In other words, he says that for all experiments performed inside a moving system, the laws of physics will appear the same as they would if the system were standing still. So the principle of relativity means that when we look at our example of the moving train and the embankment, the mechanical laws will be the same for both. In his lectures, Feynman summarizes by asking one simple question. This is a simple enough idea, and the only question is whether it is true 
that in all experiments performed inside a moving system, the laws of physics will appear the same as they would if the system were standing still. Einstein will seek to answer this question and in so doing challenge the principle of relativity. To challenge the principle of relativity, he considers items two and three of our list of conflicting theories. They are the behavior of the speed of light and the theorem of the addition of velocities. He alerts us to the potential issues in section seven of his book. He tells us that every child knows light travels at a constant speed of 300,000 kilometers per second in empty space, but then alerts us. Who would imagine that this simple law has plunged the conscientiously thoughtful physicist into the greatest intellectual difficulties? Let us consider how these difficulties arise. And this is what we shall consider in our next video.